Uh, I'd like to kick this off by bringing some really fantastic speakers up. Uh, our first group is really uh, the consummate, what I'd call hacker parents. So we have Kezia and Mike Fitzgerald. Uh, we heard about their story last year, and it was really incredibly compelling, and we're so proud and thankful that you guys are here today. Uh, Kezia and Mike uh, basically encountered a true pain point in their own lives uh, when they were battling with their child's cancer and Kezia's cancer, uh, and they hacked together a solution that I hope becomes a fantastic solution for many people around the globe. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to you to, to tell us your story. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm Kezia Fitzgerald, and my husband Mike is sitting over here. Um, and I'm going to tell sort of our <laughs> our story. And um, if we end up having time at the end, um, I will pass it over to him, and he um, will talk a little bit about uh, investors and stuff like that. But we'll start with our story and see how far we get along. Um, so. 2011 was the year of cancer for our family. In January, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And in May, just a few months later, my, our daughter, Searsha, was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. Um, she was 11 months old when she was diagnosed. Having two people in our family fighting cancer was a challenge, um, but it gave us the strength and determination to overcome any other challenge that came our way. Um, and so this is Searsha, and that's a little bit before her diagnosis and her smile sort of got us through everything because she smiled through everything. So it was definitely helpful. Um, and when her pick line was placed at 11 months old, of course, the first thing she did was put it in her mouth. <laughs> it's a great attached teething toy. Um, and so she chewed it, she pulled it, she used it as a drumstick on toys. She thought that was great. She was very percussive. <laughs> but we looked at it and said, oh my gosh, that's a direct bloodline that's going to be an infection or she's going to tear it right out of her arm. So we turned to her nurses and we said, what do we do with it? And they said, well, we'll tape it to her arm or you can cut the end of a sock off and put it over it and she'll probably leave it alone. Well, they taped it to her arm and she got irritated by the tape. It was, you know, irritating her arm. She was picking at it. She was scratching at it. She was pulling at it and it still was, you know, having a lot of issues. So Desperate to keep her from touching it, I created a, co a little cotton sleeve that went over her arm and it held it in place off of her skin and it was covered and hoped that she would forget about it. And uh, to our relief, once she had it on, she totally forgot about her line. Um, she loved it, we loved it, her nurses especially loved it, um, and other kids and their parents, they all wanted it. So later when the doctors, so this was her, she was kind of like playing and she could do whatever she wanted, it kept it out of the way and it wasn't extra tape on her skin. So when the doctors put a central line in her chest, we did this, I, you know, looked at it. It was, you know, pulling, dragging, chewing, same thing. But this time it also had the issue of it was hanging down into her diaper area, which is a huge risk of infection. So the sleeve had worked so well for her pick line that I just did the same sort of idea and created a chest wrap to keep her and her central line safe. So it protected her body and it protected her line. And once again, the line was out of sight, out of mind. She never even really knew what was going on, what it was there for. It led to less skin irritation, fewer sleep interruptions, safer lines, easier dressing changes, cleaner caps, and most importantly, a happy baby. She would run around. She was crazy. <laughs> so while my cancer went into remission, Searsha's disease progressed, and in December 2011, she died. After her death, we knew that we wanted to help other patients just like her. We saw firsthand how these garments helped not only Searsha, but other children fighting for their lives and we knew we couldn't keep them to ourselves. We founded Caroline Products as a way to get these much needed sleeves and wraps into the hands of all patients. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Mike and I went to art school, not exactly the typical preparation for starting a medical company. <laughs> and working daily on our project that relates so closely to our grief is not an easy task. But the importance of the Caroline sleeve and wrap kept us motivated to move forward through all of the challenges encountered, especially in the beginning. The first step that we had to take was to protect our idea. We started this process while Searsha was still in treatment. So we were using the garments every day, which meant that everybody who met Searsha saw them. They all wanted to know what they were. They were asking us questions, and they all actually really wanted them. So we ended up passing a bunch out to the other patients, feeling like we couldn't say, no, haha, it's mine, not yours. <laughs> so there was no way for us to keep it a secret from everybody who encountered her. So 
One day after Jimmy Fun Clinic, Mike went home and did the application online. We got to file as individuals, which meant we paid the small entity fee, so it wasn't as expensive. And everything was online, so it was easy to do after a long day at clinic, sitting there waiting for who knows what. Um, and so with our idea safer from copycats, we were able to refocus on Searsha's treatment. The only problem with filing for a provisional patent during treatment was that it started the clock on our full utility patent filing. So you only have a year from the date of your provisional patent in order to file for your utility patent. They put a lovely timer on you. Um, so it was quite a different disadvantage because we lost precious development time and revenue earning potential because we were focused on our health and we weren't actually developing the product during that, that period of time. So once we finally got Caroline's sleeves and wraps to the point where we knew we could think of starting to file for a utility patent, we had just weeks left before the deadline. Not exactly the ideal time to find an attorney and do all that paperwork. But we managed to find a wonderful patent attorney who made the whole process as simple and painless as possible and really helped us to understand exactly what we needed to do to f protect our products not only in the US but also worldwide. So finding um, that first connection really helped us realize that finding the right people to work with would make our business stronger than we could build it on our own. So while I made all of the original sleeves and wraps while cursing at my home sewing machine, and anybody who knows us and watched me do it can attest to that, <laughs> um, we knew that we couldn't make them all for mass production on our own, and I was not gonna sit and curse at my home sewing machine anymore. So, we knew we had to get the um, find a company that could mass produce them to get Caroline products up and running full scale. The designs were simple. They're literally rectangles of fabric and you know the way they're sewed makes the shape. So we knew that that wasn't an issue, but we had no idea how large scale sewing production worked. Not a clue. So our manufacturer by far was the most challenging vendor for us to find. After searching on Google, we interviewed the first sewing contractor. The first meeting was short. We showed them our product. They looked it over, um, told them why we created them. They looked at it, said seemed doable, that they would get back to us with an idea of like what the process would be that they wanted to take the project on. So we left. A few weeks later, we got an email saying that they weren't going to do the project. No reason, just rejection, just we're not going to do it. Our second sewing contractor interview was with a very small company. The manager we spoke to liked her story, but when she brought the story to um, and the product to the owner of the company, um, they didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. They thought there was going to be some sort of issue with the fact that it was a medical product, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with that. So the manager, feeling for us in our time of frustration, because at that point we were like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? She gave us a name and a phone number to call. So I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason, and our third interview was the one that made things feel right. Not only did we walk in to find them sewing dance costumes, which I grew up with a mother who owns a dance studio and danced my entire life, so I was like, I know what that is. <laughs> um, but also, the company owner's mother was there helping him that day because he was behind. And I was like, wow, like, what a family, like, family friendly, like, everybody's helping out, like, what a, like, village kind of business. Um, so this meeting was worlds different than the other two. After listening to our story, the owner took our prototypes, he looked them over, he actually held them in his hands, he started asking us questions about stitching, he talked to us about different fabric options, um, he gave us suggestions about what changes needed to be made in order to bring them into the mass production from a home production standpoint, um, and he talked to us about cost savings, and then he gave us names for local pattern makers and material suppliers. We had just met him, like just met him, never met him before except a phone call, and he was already collaborating with us. We knew that he was willing to take the time and think out of the box for us, and we knew we had found the right person to make our dream a reality. So those first production samples took a lot of work. We had to find all of our materials. We decided to source completely from the US to save on having to figure out international shipping regulations and all sorts of stuff like that and import taxes and things like that. We needed to get small quantities to test out, and it was like pulling teeth to get a few yards of fabric and a few feet of Velcro. It was crazy. <laughs> like, really, just cut a piece. Send it to me. <laughs> um, I think the biggest lesson we learned was to not bite off more than we could chew. We had big ideas and got a little overzealous when it came to our first production run, and we still have two boxes of now unusable product in our storage unit. <laughs> but. 
uh, when I look back at the products that we were first sending out and the packaging that they were in, you know, I'm looking at it cringing about, oh my goodness, I can't believe we sent these out. How, what were we thinking? But it was all part of the learning curve of entering a world that we had no idea what we were doing and we were all just trying to figure it out as we went along. That first year we had a lot of ups and downs. After all, everything we did was a first time experience. We were getting amazing feedback from customers that helped us to continue to develop and improve our products. By listening to that feedback and making changes based on our customer suggestions, we were able to make our products even more functional and helpful for our patients. From the beginning, we figured out that, if we, weren't, that we weren't gonna go and get anywhere if we didn't collaborate with other people. And really, our... Uh, hmm. Well, if we didn't collaborate with other people, and who better to collaborate with than our customers? This is where I lose my last page because it didn't print on my computer. Ta-da, the wonderful world of technology. <laughs> um, so we knew that if we listened to our customers that they were the ideal people and to help us to develop our products in a way that would make them the best that they could be for the customer. Because really it's the, you know, the customer who needs it to be right. So we knew that we were doing something that was truly helping others. We heard stories. We had parents writing us emails saying, oh my goodness, thank you so much. My children are so much happier. Um, we had adults calling us back saying, oh my gosh, I can make my scrambled eggs in the morning and now and I don't have to worry about getting my lines you know, dangling into my egg pan. So we knew we were doing something right. It was truly helping people and that we were making sure that patients, caregivers, and hospitals um, were you know, getting what they needed and we knew we wanted to differentiate the Caroline name from some of the others on the market that just didn't do what our products did. So sharing our story was the best way to make Caroline stand out in the world. While our marketing strategy has changed and evolved over the past two years, our story is the ever-present thread that keeps the brand different from the others. When we exhibit at meetings and we go to um, conventions or we present in front of hospitals and nurses, we tell every person we meet about why we develop these products and what our passion is behind them. Um, it creates a connection that keeps them listening. It also keeps them um, remembering who we are and why we did what we did. It helps us connect with parents who might think we're just trying to make a buck, but most importantly, it keeps Searsha's legacy alive and honors her struggle as well as her tri triumphs during her short life. So that's just, this is just some examples of different patients that have, that have worn them. She was very excited because she could get a puppy and he wouldn't chew on her line. <laughs> she was super excited to send us this picture. <laughs> um, okay, so this is just some conventions. I got behind on my, my slide flipping. <laughs> Um, there she is. Um, so we have learned that nothing will ever go as planned. Um, anger, frustration, and disappointment are what fuel change in the world, and they certainly fuel um, change for us. Sirsha's name means freedom in Gaelic, and I created these garments to give freedom to my child. Um, at the time, I never imagined that they would be providing comfort and freedom to patients all over the world. Sirsha may no longer be with us, but every single day she motivates us to move forward, help others, and believe that we can make life a little more comfortable for those who need it the most. Thank you. The reason I just wanted to mention something real quick is because last night talking, you know, we had a few beers in this and everybody's talking about different things that are happening. One of the common things that came up in some conversations were investment. Um, that's a key and that's a key part to any strategy when you're developing this product. Kezia mentioned several times about connecting with our vendors. It's important to us to have products made in the United States, but it's also important to find people that are close to us that understand what we're doing um, to invest in our products. Uh, we've made some mistakes in that area, but we've also learned a lot of lessons in that area. Um, we thought that it was really important. Uh, we had big eyes when we first started, and we had somebody come to us and say they were gonna give us seed money, and how do you turn that down? You don't, um, because th this product is very important. We know it's gonna help a lot of people. Um, coming into our next area, though, looking for an investor, it's important for us to find investors, and it should be for you as well, um, in developing products and, and launching it into the market, to find somebody that connects with you and, and understands what's going on and has connections in the world that you're focusing on. I think that's really important. It's even more so important to create a win-win situation for everybody, because that's what our goals should be, because our main goal is to help kids. 
and we are now. We have distributors in the United States, Canada, Australia, and now all of the European Union, Saudi Arabia, and soon to be Singapore and Japan. But that wasn't just sitting down and waiting for people to call us. We had to get on the phone. We had to get all the media coverage we could, and that's the other important aspect of this, getting people's attention. Um, but I think uh, everything else, Kezia hit right on the money, and, uh, but you guys are doing a great job, and we can't hear, wait to hear what everybody has to say today. It's going to be fun.